USDGC has come to a close and we finally got to see who has what it takes to take down this major and quote unquote non-major A tier, whatever. We had a lot of legends that actually showed up today and some others that just kind of withered. But with all that said, let's get into it and figure out how USDGC ended. And before we get to any coverage, I will say that a lot of people have gripes with having to pay extra to watch Major. I understand that perspective, but I think because it is owned by Innova and they have like some weird rules, I don't really foresee this change in the near future. So yes, it did require the pro subscription, but all in all, it's only like a couple bucks more. You can just immediately unsubscribe because there's nothing in the off season that I would recommend watching. But honestly, the moment that next week ends, you can just totally unsubscribe until chess.com. So for me personally, I would never recommend a yearly subscription because almost certainly you will not get your money's worth. And the only other contract had to be, of course, that the fact that it is still an A tier, it makes no sense for FPO to remain an A tier. And if we did have a world where US Women's was like a fifth major, that'd be fine. The world would still exist totally fine, but it is pretty disrespectful to call this an A tier for all these FPO players because ultimately this is effectively a major. But with that, let's get into FPO. And on to FPO, this is definitely kind of how I thought it would pan out, but the way that it did was just so bizarre. So like I said in my previous video, I feel like the first two rounds were not a great display from Owen or Kristen. There were just so many missed shots, so many missed putts, and it felt like their entire momentum was just kind of lacking. We definitely know they are capable of going like 9, 10 under, but then Kristen turned it around a full 180 degrees and was dialed and focused past hole 7 of round 3, going 8 under for the remainder of that round, and then managed to go 8 under in the first 11 holes of the final round so even though she was leading by two strokes to start it it was basically a done deal after just a few holes and that's because the only player that was even close was evelina who was just a little bit off on her first shot of the first hole missed the mando and got a bogey on a very birdieable hole and for the first time at least in recent history evelina's shot shaping was the worst part of her game she literally went a hundred percent from circle one i want to reiterate that a hundred percent 11 circle one putts but everything else on her game was just not really clicking sure she had a nice turkey in the middle stretch but for the most part there was never a point that she was truly in contention and finishes around two under at a 950. so despite her being only two strokes back to start the day she finishes seven strokes back from Kristen. and honestly i don't know if she was trying to like rush her drives a little bit more than normal but it felt like so many of the shots were just a little bit off a little bit too high they would go into the hazard or out of bounds but truly never had any blow up holes never had any egregious missed putts so it definitely kind of felt like a twilight zone round for her but on the total flip side, Kristen just could not miss a single shot it felt like. And before the first hole even started, I was noticing her vibes and like her, I hate to say this, her aura, but her aura was just so locked in. She was so focused. I was like, okay, she's going to win this. Even before I see her throw her first shot, the reason that I say this is because we haven't seen her truly locked in for a couple of months now, with her last win being in August. And so it felt really good to see her return to form. But there was one putt that stood out that was honestly some of the craziest shot shaping I've ever seen. And that that would be hole 13 after an amazing stretch of birdies she totally shanked her upshot and was 65 feet out and had basically no look at the basket because there was trees all around the basket and then somehow she has enough anheuser to her putt and jams it in and i feel like yes if she makes those she's gonna win this so it truly felt like after round two it was the start of her tournament and she basically never looked back gaining strokes on everybody only missing one circle one putt in round three and only missing two circle one putts in the final round and like i said even though evelina's game was just totally off in this final round she did have one of the most insane putts that you never expect to go in but on hole eight after a super terrible missed mando that could have definitely been an eagle she was like super pinched off in this tree having to have a putt around the bushes and it's like no way she ever makes that and then it just jams in almost no chains and i feel like that is one of the best shots we've ever seen from evelina and i truly don't even think she believed it but because her round was already so bad she didn't really care too much but back to the champ after hole 11 it was basically done and she kind of just coasted her way on through which included a couple of birdies and a near assassination on hole 18 where she throws it right into the crowd on her upshot of course it didn't matter because she was up by like seven strokes but just hilarious to see but with that she secures her final sort of major win so now she can officially say that she has won every single major or major asterisk and secures $13,000, which I feel like doesn't actually matter to her, but maybe it does. I don't know. And she finishes the event with 1,004 rated. So even though her recent play is definitely sub 1,000 rated, I do think her equilibrium is around that 1,000 points. So I do think it'll jump back up next year. Feels so good. Um, 
the week felt so long and I just uh, reminded myself here's your chance so make the best out of it and, and that's what exactly what I did I don't know but I, I remember just walking down some of the fairways and I was thinking oh my gosh I feel like myself again <laughs> yeah the the game seemed uh, super easy today and it's so much fun playing that way this video is sponsored by Vessi I hit the amazing opportunity to play some of the best courses in Germany and let me tell you Germany is wet it was constantly raining on me and the thing that made all my rounds feel so easy was my storm burst so whether it's it's rain or shine, these shoes are designed to keep you cool, dry, and ready to perform. So if you want to get your own Vessies, go down to Vessie.com slash wild runs and get 15% off your first purchase at checkout. I guarantee you will not go wrong with the Stormburst low top or high top. They truly feel like the best blend of high performing and high traction shoes you can get in the market. So look no further than Vessie. All right, so on to MPO. There was so many crazy things that happened, starting with, of course, Nate Doss. I spoke about him before, but he did not let up and he actually finished very respectably in 37th place. And he would have actually gotten a lot better, but he just had a pretty unlucky double in hole 18. <laughs> and like before, let me tell you who he beat. James Proctor, Alden Harris, Ben Calloway, Ed Robinson, Casey White, <laughs> and Emerson Keith. And I know in my previous video, people were saying like, obviously like Nate Doss is one of the legends. Why would he not do well? Let me tell you what he does now. He runs a brewing company, doesn't play much disc golf, I presume. And he is a little bit overweight, not to body shame, but he is a little bit not in his prime shape for uh, athletic endeavors. So yes, I don't expect him to do great things, but he did amazing and I'm very proud of him. But enough about him, before we get to the contenders, there was two players that I really felt like really shined. And number one would be Gavin, who ultimately had just very mid levels of disc golf for the first three and a half rounds and then it flipped just switched and he was like actually I, I do want to play good disc golf and he went off on a total tear getting a birdie or eagle on the last 10 holes in a row and so he goes 11 under through the last 10 holes absolutely insane and nobody else was even close to that so that was really cool to see a return to form because we haven't really seen it in a while and I'm just waiting to see a podium finish for him because I know he is so good he just has not been able to string it together after his injury but a player that was much more in coverage would be Vino. With him being a little bit too far back to be even in like podium contention, it was still incredibly fun and engaging to see a Finn that was not Nicholas totally shred today. And throughout the entire weekend, I felt like his confidence levels were incredibly high. His putting was just perfect. And every round but the first, he eagles hole 10. And even though his form is a little bit unorthodox, I think it is super interesting. And I feel like ever since the switch to Innova, he has had kind of like a mental switch to maybe work a little bit harder to be a top elite pro. And even though his final round had a few too many bogeys and he finishes in fifth, still amazing performance for him him and very reminiscent of Rebecca Cox in the early rounds where you don't expect great things but he had so many great shots so good on you Vino and even though Isaac finishes tied for fifth as well I don't really think there's too much to say he just kind of played good not great missed a lot of putts and never really felt like he was that interesting to watch and in kind of similar fashion we got sad Rick today and whenever sad Rick comes you know it's just going to be a meh round so even though the round started I knew his raptor legs were ready to run they they were not running today there was a lot of failures especially on the front nine and he finishes his final round with four OBs so even though he had a pretty hot stretch in the middle half didn't really matter he finishes in fourth and if you're rick you don't really care about fourth place and frankly neither do i but it really was a battle between ab and ganon now i would say ganon was in full control in the front nine and it felt like okay if there are any missteps from ab he is effectively done but again and again ab would be kind of pinched off in these like not great positions and then he would clutch up like especially on hole three has a 60 footer that you're like i mean he could make this but he's probably not going to and then he jams it in dead center and at that point i was like okay this could be a battle where ab somehow clutches up and at that point i was like okay he can make this very interesting but just looking at the confidence levels coming from ganon i was like i don't think ganon's gonna mess up at all and then we move on to hole five and ab is running it hard on the water and because the drop off is so quick it skips ever so slightly in the water turning a very gettable birdie into a par and after that ganon was leading by one stroke and effectively there was not a single moment where Ganon ever let up that lead. And so despite Ganon having some mess ups, it just didn't really matter. AB just could not capitalize. And then I feel like the real nail in the coffin was holes seven through 11. Starting with hole seven, AB totally misses the Mando and Ganon gets a super lucky break that bounces right up to the basket. And then AB goes out of bounds on nine, turning that into a bogey. But I feel like the real turning point was hole 11, AB is down by two and he really needs to execute this shot to get a birdie. 
And then this happens. Extremely unexplicable. I have no words. This is just insanely bad. I think any pro should know not to get too close to the bush. And I have to think he was going for just a little bit too much distance. Didn't really think about how close he was to the hedge, but he advances like 30 feet and he turns that into a bogey. And of course, Ganon birdies. So we have a four stroke separation. And so Ganon knew he could play safe for the duration of the tournament. So I think a lot of fans got a little turned off because it was like, okay, Ganon's gonna win again. Cool, whatever. But he still dominated. He still did so well to get to this point. So yes, it may not be the most crazy finish, but all in all, still so, so hyped to see Ganon secure this second USGGC win. And obviously AB has the potential and has done it in the past to clutch up in these high stress moments, but it just was not on display today, despite having some amazing putts. But after that hole, there was one point where things could have gotten a little bit spicy and that was hole 17. Ganon is like 30 feet out and he is super committed on his putt and it almost bounces into the out of bounds, which would have been a bogey and put him one stroke back of Calvin. And then he could have bogeyed hole 18 to move into a playoff. Ultimately, that did not happen, but that would have been crazy. I understand you want hole 18 to be no stress hole, but still, man, just lay up no stresses with that. But with that said, I have not talked about the legend of this round and it wasn't Gavin, even though Gavin did amazing things. It was Calvin. So in typical Calvin fashion, he only shows up when it effectively doesn't matter. So since he was on chase card, it felt like, okay, yeah, even if he does great, he's probably not really going to matter. But oh my goodness, going 11 under through 12, he was on a heater. He could not miss a shot. And if he could throw like a Paul-esque perfect round, then there was a world where he could have just flat out won. But it seems like Vinny always has one or two holes where he is in very much perfect positions and he just kind of throws it away. And that was definitely true for hole 13 where he could have birdied, but then kind of messed up. And then he has like a circle's edge putt and then he misses that and turns that into a bogey. And then he throws into the hazard on hole 16. And so despite being so, so close to making it interesting, ultimately he just was not close enough. And so he finishes two strokes back of Ganon, finishing tied with AB, which is wild because Calvin was eight strokes back of AB to start the day. And so all in all, I have to say, I know AB probably doesn't like this final round, but he had a great performance the entire tournament, just had a few too many missteps. And honestly, the player that I want more from is actually Calvin. I feel like he had so many moments in the first three rounds where he could have been in a much better position, specifically hole 12 in round two, where he went double OB at a spot where you gain no distance. It's not a hazard. And so he turned that into a quad. And I know what ifs don't matter. But let me just entertain the notion. If he did just play it safe for like a bogey, that would have been three strokes better and he would have won. But ultimately, what ifs don't really matter. And Ganon wins his second USGGC. And overall, I feel like Ganon was in full control. There was nothing that he was afraid of. There was no moment that was too much for him. And I know the world wants to say he's boring. I don't really want to watch him. He's really slow. At this point, I really don't even want to hear it because everyone could say that about Paul, but they don't. So I think this is just what greatness looks like. And if you don't like it too bad, Ganon will be here for a long, long time, literally just 19 years old. And especially in his interview, you can just tell how analytical he is and how knowledgeable he is about every single shot shape. Kind of just feels unbelievable. Two time is crazy. And, uh, you know, have a, I guess winning at this course twice is something that I'll, you know, remember forever. I could have never imagined eight wins in two majors in one season. Uh, just absolutely crazy. I think, uh, you know, I just love disc golf so much. This is truly what the new era of disc golf looks like, and I'm so here for it. So with that said, what did you guys think about this whole tournament? Did you like it, not like it? Did you not even watch because you don't even want to pay? I wouldn't judge you if you didn't, but all in all, I'm so glad we got this tournament because it almost didn't happen with all the hurricane damage. So with that, thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to go down to vessi.com slash wild runs to get 15% off your first purchase. Thank you guys so much for watching. Wild Runs, signing out. Peace.